Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, whoever you are. I am the Oliver Perry, just Oliver Perry. Uh, I've got another great guest on today. I'm laughing because we made a joke a little bit earlier about that. But I've got another great guest on today, and he's going to talk with us about real estate investing and hopefully put you guys on the right path in your real estate investing journey. Let's get into it. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome Mr. Lane Kawaoka. Lane, what's up, brother? Can you hear me? Hey, thanks hey. for having me, Oliver. Hello, everybody. Fantastic, man. All right, brother. So I know you've been playing this real estate game for a little while. I believe it's 2009 you started out, but I wanted the listeners to have some kind of context to you. So if you could give them a quick background bio on you and we can hop into it a little bit deeper. Yeah, currently um, owner of 6,000 rental properties. We syndicate um, multifamily apartments, a lot of workforce housing where we value add uh, stabilized assets. Um, but I think what we're going to talk about a lot today is, well, how the hell do you get started, right? Because I mean, 6,000 units, that's just vanity metrics. I started investing in 2009 as I was working my engineering job and just bought little rental properties and plugged away. And you know, that's the cool thing about real estate is that it's a, not a get rich quick thing, but it's a get rich surely thing. I love it. I love it. That's absolutely the fact, Lane. I'm looking forward to talking to you about this. And because 6,000 units is not where we want to start, right? Because <laughs> everybody's not going to have that 6,000 units just off a break from starting in. So let's talk about how you got started. Because you got started, uh, like you said, you left your, your nine to not really left your nine to five. You were still at your nine to five and you figured it out. How did you end up making that big transition into real estate investing just solely? I mean, it, it took me at least 10 years to wow. finally quit my day job. I mean, I was saving maybe about 30 to $100,000 a year, more in the beginning mm -hmm. um, when I was a lot more frugal and it's pretty, pretty cheap back then. You know, I just plowed <laughs> all my money into buying rental properties. Right. Uh, 2009 was when I bought my first one. And around 2015, I had 11. And at that point, I started to go into apartment complexes. Uh, but, you know, People don't realize, like, you know, you're just kind of constrained to how much money you can save. I mean, I don't do any wholesaling, flipping, all this burr stuff that kids talk about all the time. I mean, it's just straight up buy and hold rentals because my time was better spent at my day job making my salary there. Right. So with that said, it sounds like me like you had to make a, quite a few sacrifices. What were kind of the bigger sacrifices that you had to make that allowed you to get on the path to be able to keep putting that money away? Because I imagine there's a lot of habits you had to break around that, too, as well. Yeah, I mean, luckily, I kind of grew up in a household where we talk to be frugal, you know, you know, buy stuff you don't need, um, maybe or more skewed on the frugal cheap side, of course. Um, so for me, saving, you know, I made close to six figures starting out of college, mm -hmm. but I saved most of my paycheck in it that went into buying rental properties. Wow. Um, so for me, it wasn't, I mean, I guess it was kind of like sacrificing, but I already had that, you know, I was never in credit card debt. I right. wasn't paid off my student loans pretty quickly. Um, I mean, it's just, sometimes it's good to not get used to that lifestyle creep and delay that as much as possible. But I mean, you know, a lot of people I work with today, I mean, they're the people who max out their 401ks, have good professional paying jobs over 60, 70 grand a year. Right. You know, like that's, that's a simple passive cash flow way. I mean, if you don't have money, you don't, you know, you make less than 60 grand a year. You know, there's all this other stuff that, you know, I'm sure you can go to bigger pockets and all that type of stuff. That's more right. active real estate investing. But, you know, I think everybody needs to get on the path at some point, you know, when your net worth gets above a million hundred grand or you make a decent salary to get on the more passive investing train right that may, that makes perfect sense so with that said what are your kind of principles the guidelines that you give when somebody asks you hey hey Lane, how do i get started what are your principles on the best way to start real estate investing yeah i mean you know like the prerequisite is you got to be good with your money right like you can't be spending more than you make and you have to have a decent salary which we kind of discussed but okay. moving off of that right like let's just zoom in we got a guy who you know can save five, ten thousand dollars at the very least a year. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, save up for a few years to go buy your first rental with you know twenty thirty uh, twenty thirty grand, you know, mm -hmm. twenty percent down payment on a not owner occupied property. And you know, a lot of the place that 
places we'll look for is more secondary and tertiary markets as opposed to the primary markets like California, Hawaii, Seattle, New York. Right. You're not going to cash flow in those areas, uh, more importantly. And secondly, of course, it's very expensive, right? It's, you know, you'd be lucky to buy a place in the ghetto for 400 grand right. that rents for $2,000 a month. <laughs> That's a fact. So, you know, the typical, we're, we're starting people out with like $100,000 houses that rent for $1,000 a month. So you get that 1% rent to value ratio. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Uh, that's it's interesting you say that because I've seen so many properties, particularly in California, and just like you said, smack middle of Oakland or Compton or something wild, and it's a million dollar rental or it's not a million dollar purchase as opposed to you know being able to cash flow or what have you, which seems wild to be able to start there. Um, yeah. So with that said, you talked about you know the cash flow versus the equity. What what part of that? do you recommend when people are starting should they be going strictly after cash flow or should they be looking at the equity play kind of that long ball if you will i mean i don't doubt like real estate typically goes up in price and right. appreciation can be pretty explosive and people rub it off my face all all the time and look i bought a <laughs> i'm an idiot i bought a place in san francisco for 200 grand and now right. it's worth 700 i'm like well what do you do for you right like it's right. been a bull market for the last 10 years it all works till it doesn't. I mean, mm. cash flow is a lot more prudent, in my opinion, and it kind of works even in a bad economy. I mean, it depends how you're looking at it, right? If you're super broke, then you might have to take some chances. But if, again, like most of my folks have good paying jobs. I mean, if you just play the, the long game, the long game doesn't take that long for this to start to really work. Right. Usually, most people can get financially free five to 10 years doing this type of stuff. So I say, well, just do the cash flow, right? Do the slow and steady. You'll get to where you want to be a heck of a lot faster than the normal people in marketable securities and the 401k garbage. Mm, that's a really good point. I never I never thought about that. It's a really, really good point because you're going to, just like you said, the market's always going to go up until it just doesn't. And then we all experienced that in 2018. As a matter of fact, how did you, not 2018, 2008, but how did you deal? Because you were in the game, you were just getting into the game around that time, right? So how did you deal with that? Because it sound, I imagine that was kind of to your advantage as well, being in two hundred nine, that you know things are a little bit sketchy at that time, though, right? Yeah, I mean that was it was a hell of a time to get started, right? I mean I'm <laughs> right. no, I'm not I'm not like an idiot. Like I got really lucky, right? I'm kind of like the outliers in Michael Gladwell's book. I mean I took advantage of it, but. And I bought my first couple properties in Seattle, Washington, a mm. very primary market, high appreciation market. But soon after, I got I got smart and I realized, you know, this is, thing isn't going to go up all the time. So I pulled out of my properties in 2014, 15 to go into a completely out of state market. Um, so I bought 11 rentals in Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis, and I got rid of my Seattle stuff. Of course, I look kind of look like an idiot today, right? Because the property is appreciated in Seattle so much more in the last handful of years. Mm. But, you know, I mean, I could also kind of point to my rentals and, you know, look where they are now, right? I, yeah. I took those 11 rentals and in the same time, over 6,000 today. Um, cash flow works too. And cash flow is more prudent. Um, just it, to get paid on a monthly basis. I mean, I think that was like, at that time, that was a big goal of mine was to quit my day job as an engineer that I didn't really like. I mean, appreciation is cool and it's very explosive and it has its cons like how we mentioned, but right. like you can't eat appreciation. It doesn't put food on the table. It's not that reoccurring monthly revenue that you can use to pay your, you know, your, your, month, your monthly bills and eventually quit your day job. So, I mean, you would have found me maybe like five, seven years ago. That was my number one goal. Maybe not financial freedom, but at least it replaced my income from my day job. So that's why I consciously moved to cash flow investing so that I could at least do that. Um, kind of set me up to kind of take this full time real estate investing. But that was the bigger goal at the time. Right. So what was the litmus, t litmus test for that goal? Because normally when people do that, they have like, hey, I'm going to hit this number and then I'm going to move on. Was that was that a case for you or were you just like, hey, I'm just going to at this date, I'm out. Um, I mean, the way I did it, I mean, I was a passive investor. I mean, I what I was starting to do is like I went for more private sector, high stress jobs. Right. I took a little less pay, went for easier jobs. And I created a pretty nice lifestyle for myself, you know, around 2015, 16. Um, 
but then um, and that was probably that probably would have been an awesome life right I mean, right just keep investing in syndications and rental properties just increasing the cash flow from that point but then i started to you know go general partner on a lot of these apartment projects and unlike most people i mean just i mean i, I needed to kind of spend most of my time doing it, it became a you know the new rat race so that's right. where it was unique for myself okay that makes sense so with that said lane let me ask you you made the transition from nine to five to single family from single family to multifamily and you do some i believe you're doing some rv and stuff like that as well and at times what is the biggest similarities and differences between the single family and the multifamily game um, I mean, it's not really like the single family, the multifamily. It's more from like active investor to passive investor, right? Like, okay. You know, when you're going from little doing your own deals, right? You're talking to property managers, brokers, a lot of these vendors. Right. Um, and you're kind of networking with other single family home folks. But for, once your net worth goes over half a million, million dollars, I mean, it's kind of a reboot. Like you're not talking to any of those guys anymore. They're, they're pretty, it's, the relationships you built up in single family home world don't carry on to the passive investor world. And mm -hmm. now you're trying to find other pure passive accredited investors to build relationships with, right. to find where you're going to invest in, more importantly, who to stay away from, the tax um, strategies that the wealthy use that change all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things like infinite banking, stuff like that. I mean, it, it becomes like kind of a schmoozing game, right. you know, so people who are <laughs> unable to like build relationships with other peers, Right. It ain't going to work for you guys. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, for some people, like a lot of, you know, like a lot of white collar professionals, it actually is easier for them. It's easier yeah. for them to talk to other folks like themselves than the blue collar trades people that are fixing up their house, the contractors or the property managers, the grant workers. I mean, so for some people, it might be easier. Um, kind of a lot more fun. I mean, more wine parties. Definitely <laughs> doing it that way. But that to me is their big reboot. And so right. many people like, you know, if you're net, it, unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, it's it's there's a big barrier in terms of where your net worth is. If you're under half a million dollars net worth, or even under a million dollars net worth, you're kind of seen as broke, and you can't really push into these these upper echelons of you know you're just kind of getting into the next level, right? Right. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. With so with with the multifamily part and you doing the passive part, what is what what did you feel like was the the true because the number is a number right you can get that and borrow that from someone else when it comes to passive investing not necessarily that i recommend it or don't recommend it just saying it's, a, it's an ability but for you what was kind of the barrier of entry mentally for you because that's a that's got to be something that you kind of racked your brain about for a little bit like ah do i really want to do i yeah. really want to do it that kind of thing so how'd you yeah if it if it not break broke don't fix it right like i right. had 11 rentals in 2015 and bringing in maybe a few thousand dollars of cash flow a month. But, you know, if anybody owns that many rentals or you're kind of wondering, well, what the hell is it like to own that many rentals? Well, right. I'll tell you, I mean, first of all, I have a property manager that does everything for me. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to do eviction. Right. I still don't. <laughs> I don't know how to fix toilets. I mean, put it like a shower head on my shower. I don't know how to do that type of stuff. <laughs> don't um, feel bad, Lane. Neither do I. You're good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like... With 11 rentals, I maybe had an eviction or two every year, some kind of big catastrophe that happened every quarter, like a tree fall on the house or some kind of big plumbing issue. No problem, right? Property manager takes care of all that nonsense for me. But, you know, with 11 rentals, that was only a few thousand dollars of cash flow a month. I mean, right. when I was in my early 20s, I would have dreamed to have that type of stuff. But I don't know what American family, you know, can survive off three Gs a month. You're going to need more like 10. Therefore, you're going to need 30 of these houses. So just ex just multiply that exception rate that I just mentioned by three. So now an eviction every every month or two and some kind of big catastrophe that happens every every two weeks. But you can quickly realize that it's just not not scalable. And as you pay off your property, your, your equity position gets larger. It's just impossible for you to start to like roll your cash into the next deal, into the next deal, refinance. Right. And you'll make your lenders like at rich doing this stuff with all the transaction origination <laughs> fees by doing all these stupid all-in-one loans that make no sense to me right um but like that's and 
that's where I was like, yeah, this is just not scalable. This is about the time where I kind of got lucky. I, I paid to join into different masterminds, get around other high net worth and private investors. And a lot of them were very similar pedigree to myself. Um, and they, they were single family home refugees going into these bigger deals and right. you know, they find diversification into actually even stronger deals, right? Where you're, there's value add. So were you, when you started out, were you, did, did you ever do the same thing as far as the mastermind part? Cause I know at, at a higher level, lots of people join masterminds, but at a lower level, were you even looking at masterminds or associations? Uh, no, I mean, I, I was super cheap back then. I was always like, you know, the solo ro rolling guy. I mean, right. I didn't trust anybody too. And, but I think looking back on it, like, mm -hmm. I think sometimes I see the mistake of these guys who are under maybe half a million dollars net worth. That's kind of the threshold, I think. Like if you're under half a million dollars, don't waste your time on any of this type of stuff. I mean, because likely you're not, it doesn't matter because everybody around you in those kinds of networks are broke anyway. And they're all looking right. out for themselves too. Mm. Not until you kind of get past that or certainly past a million dollars net worth does the network really make more sense. And so it's, I, I feel like it's kind of half true, right? They say their network is your net worth. Right. But really, I mean, once you hit that half a million, million dollar threshold, I think that's when that comes into play. Um, if you're less than that, we'll, we'll make some money. We'll save some money. And look, it just takes time. Right? It took Absolutely. me like five years to kind of get my net worth over like the hundred quarter million level. Now, with that said, how, how much did your mindset change, though, Lane? Between that, between that five year period where you went from nine to five to single family and then kicked it up another notch. What was the kind of mental, the mental part that you had to change in yourself to get to the level where you're at now? Um, I mean, I just, it's, it's kind of slow and incremental when I look back at it. I mean, every, I think most of us are kind of the same, right? We think about this stuff all the time and just yeah. kind of making micro improvements. Sometimes, you're wasting a lot of times. And I think that's where having a mentor and having a community around you really starts to help expedite this stuff. It gets the, you know, the, the, the dumb ideas out of your head and so you can kind of move on, right. making progress on the right ones. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it, I think like what, what I do today is like, you know, there's a lot of people with already a million dollars net worth and there's really no community for that. So that's why I kind of created Simple Passive cash flow. You know, for more of those higher income earners because they skip all over this burr stuff, house hacking nonsense, cold selling properties. Right. I mean, that's what you do when you need money, right? But what if you do when you already have money? Well, you kind of helicopter to a different set of strategies where it, it is a lot simpler. I mean, and when you're starting out, they're so complicated because you have all these more active strategies and it's very complicated. What do you do? But when you have money, when your net worth goes over a million dollars, it becomes very clear and simple. Right. You invest in good deals, you diversify, you know, put more than 5% of your net worth into any one opportunity. Um, you're investing for the, the tax advantage. You know, Instead of single family homes, now you're doing cost segs to get a bunch of passive activity losses. Now this unlocks all these tax strategies that the wealthy do, real estate professional status. You save more money, you pay less taxes, and you put in an infinite banking program, and you're off and rolling, right? I mean, it's just, unfortunately, it's... You know, you know, I mean, for the for the rich guys, it's easy. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, I think we all kind of knew that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's, before we continue, I want you to go a little bit into the cost. You, you mentioned cost segs, and I know the audience listening is normally somewhere between beginner and intermediate level, and that's not always something that they hear. Can you break down the cost segregation, the cost segs, and how that works? Yeah, I mean, essentially, I think we all know that you can deduct the price, the building improvement over 27 years in single family home or even, you know, even duplex or triplex or quads, it's all the same. Right. Um, so you can take like a 127th paper loss. And a lot of times that's more than enough to, you know, wipe out your cash flow for the year, effectively making your gains tax free because you're taking the passive losses or the deductions or the depreciation and you're offsetting your passive income. Now, what a cost seg will do is, I mean, you know, and our, what we'll do is we'll pay eight to ten grand, and eight to ten grand is nothing on a large deal. So we pay that for a geek squad to come in, do this big report for us, and give the this big stack of papers to our other CPA, the other geek squad. <laughs> and what they do is now they're able to write off a third of the building bill all in the first year, right. instead of twenty-seven long years. 
all said and done, what this does is it allows to keep this huge paper loss in the first year on people's K1s. And now they can have these, this, this huge uh, amount of passive losses. Now they can use that to offset their ordinary income possibly if they can implement real estate professional status. Now, if your net, if your adjusted gross income is under two to three hundred thousand dollars, probably doesn't make much sense for you. Does you know? Probably I wouldn't pay much attention. But for a lot of doctors making you know three, four, five, six hundred thousand you know, to lower your AGI a couple hundred grand can mean a tax savings of a hundred thousand dollars at the end of the day. Right? right. That's a lot of freaking rental properties, right? <laughs> and it illustrates the point that after a certain point, it's not really about investing. Everybody geeks out on the latest horror strategy or whatever. It's like, well, once you get past a certain point in terms of network and income, it's more about taxes. Mm. Wow, that's a, that's a good breakdown. That's a really, really good breakdown. I've heard breakdowns before, but that's probably the best cost seg breakdown I've heard up to this point. Uh, you made that really simple and easy to understand. So hopefully those of you who are watching and listening, you truly got and understood what Lane's talking about. If not... Lane's going to make sure we give Lane off his IG and email and all that great stuff. You can hit him up as well and ask him directly. So, Lane, you talked about the passive, simply passive cash flow, your show, as well as the community you're kind of building. How did you get to that point? What made you decide to do that as your basically not I'm not going to say your brand, but more or less your community that you're speaking with and speaking to? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of started the podcast back in 2016 when all my friends were asking me, well, how are you buying these properties in Birmingham, Atlanta? Right. You don't even, like, you don't visit them. You right. know, like, you don't even, like, look at the properties. How the heck are you doing that? Then, you know, you, I'm sure you guys have friends. You guys tell them, and they don't do anything. They just kind of waste your time, right? So I just recorded it on a podcast and made some MP3s, put it out there, and just started to kind of talk about a lot of this stuff and, kind of my lessons learned, the mistakes, and, you know, that kind of went on for about a year um, in 2016, and then I started to get a lot of, like, positive feedback from people, like, you know, hey, you know, you don't know who I am, but, you know, like, I took what you did, and I, you know, I bought a rental property, <laughs> Dad, <Right>. you know, like, <laughs> I'm like, well, thanks, man, I guess I, you know, hopefully I made it seem like it wasn't that hard, you know, heck, if I did it, how bad can it be? Um, but then, you know, as... I became more of an accredited investor. I started to change my investment strategy and the taxes, the vehicle, the infinite banking. And the show kind of followed me to this more accredited investing kind of land. And I think a lot of people, you know, they told all of their friends, they came along with me. And that was kind of the, the genesis of simple passive cash flow today. And, you know, like what I'd say a lot is like your network is your net worth when your net worth is over a million dollars. So and there's not, there's really no other shows that, you know, tracks high net worth working professionals that aren't broke, right? right that right. have money. I mean, everybody's out there kind of teaching how to do a house hack or a burr. I mean, there, there, are, there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of people out there that need them, right? So right. I get it. But I mean, what do you do? Like I say, if you're a high paid engineer, doctor, and you know this stuff is kind of new to you, and you don't want to wholesale houses or flip houses. You're kind of past that type of stuff in terms right. of scalability right and it makes sense because that even that community needs people to kind of give them the instruction and, and break down the process because it's not a simple process particularly with passive investing you know hey what what numbers do i need to know where am i looking why am i looking there like all these are questions that translate even from those beginners to the advanced or those who are in like you said doctors and dietitians and politics and so on and so forth like yeah. they need somebody to learn from too as well so that's a really I mean, awesome but the, the the truth is like mm -hmm. for a higher net worth investor it's really not what you know it's who you know right I mean, if you build relationships with other passive investors and you start to really cultivate those relationships mm -hmm. just kind of copy what other people are doing i mean it's like you got you got it changes really from cool like you. understanding like when you're getting started or when i got started you got to understand what the hell's in the black box right like you got to analyze properties you gotta do all this stuff you gotta call this property manager call the lender right it's complicated um, but when you're more of an accredited investor i mean it's more like well what does the black box look from the outside 
Right. You, know, you may or may not want to understand what the hell is in the black box, but that's inherently what the why it's called a black box, right? You need to know what it is from the outside because you just find the blocks. Um, and how do you do that? Well, it's the people around you. It's the, the passive investors that you've kind of cultivated those relationships with. That's a really good point. So with, with the passive investors, though, what, what kind of questions should they be asking when they get the opportunity to invest in something, particularly when it comes to multifamily, like syndications or JVs? What kind of questions do you recommend them to ask when it's that kind of situation? I mean, this is kind of a trick question. I mean, in my opinion, I mean, mm -hmm. asking like you shouldn't ask any questions. You should already know if you're investing based on your peer group, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, easier said than done if you're like myself or like most people coming into this game. Where none of your parents invested in this stuff. No, right. None of your friends are accredited investors. Um, what I would suggest is go to my website, check out my free syndication light um, course at simplepassivecashflow.com slash syndication. We have a more in-depth e-course that kind of talks about all the tricks and tips for passive investors to go get into this stuff. Um, but I would say just get educated first. I mean, and I tell people a lot, like talking to the syndicator is a waste of time. Right, it's a sales guy. They're gonna tell you everything you want to hear. You know, <laughs> that's true. Play the long game yeah, and go we'll find passive investors that actually invested with this guy. Right. And what you find out, most people have never really, they don't really have a track record. And whether you ask them the questions or not, they're just gonna ask ask the questions. But you have you have not, no ability to verify track record of performance unless you find people who have gone through their pipeline before, gone through the past deal, have a positive experience to right. tell about it. Right. Yeah. And that's, I think that's, that's one of the biggest separators I noticed from the side of syndication. Cause I've done some, I'm doing some, a syndication now. And one of the biggest things that I see is, Hey, do you have experience? And the way that we worked it out on ours is we get somebody who's been playing the game for a while with a great reputation. He knows people and so on and so forth. This way, when the investor comes says, Hey, I want to invest. They don't feel uncomfortable because we're a bunch of brand newbies and we don't know what we're doing. They're more comfortable. Yeah. Hey, we've got Tom who's been doing this for 30 years. We're following his lead point blank and period. We want to win with this just like everybody else. So I, I think that's a really, really good point is just like you said, your peer group talking. It's, it's like uh, the investor's version of Yelp. Talk to the people around you. If they know the people, then go with the reviews. If they don't kind of, you know, be leery. Leave that alone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, like past investors are not going to be underwriting specialists, but I do agree that there is some things in the underwriting or not the underwriting, uh, but in the pitch deck that you should be able to key in on, like the right. reversion cap rate, what is the rent increases per year, what are the annual escalators, those things that kind of spot check um, that are the, are the perform the performer might say double your money in three or five years, but right. you can use whatever the hell kind of assumptions you want to get that. Right. We all know how spreadsheets work. You just plan with a couple cells. And you can greatly influence the outcome at the end. So I think that's kind of level two, right? Like once mm -hmm. you, I mean, this is a lot of stuff that will teach passive investors, but for most people, it's just like start off building relationships with other people, then start really start to learn these types of concepts. Um, and most, most passive investors don't have a clue about this type of stuff and they don't need to. Right. That's the point. But if you were right. so inclined and you really want to kind of dig into the numbers and actually, you know, be able to call BS when the operator is saying, oh, bring conservative, conservative, blah, 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 blah. Right. You know, this is the stuff that you need to learn. And it doesn't require you to kind of, you know, manipulate P&Ls and rent rolls, right? That's more of that, that more advanced level. That's more of getting on your general partnership type of level. But I always feel like in anything, there's like a bare minimum, minimum effective dose, if you will. Right. Right. No, that's... Jesus Lane, that's really good. From hearing this from being a syndicator, working on the syndicator side of things and seeing this from someone who's on the passive side, hearing this is really enlightening because it's not something yeah. that you hear, particularly when you're learning and figuring it out and you're going to the other side and you're talking, it. you know, hey, conservative, conservative, conservative. Yeah, that sounds good. But at the end of the day, the, the proof is in the numbers. Exactly yeah. what's going on there, period. Just like you said. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a syndicator and like I'm in this business and it's hard for me to tell who's freaking legit out there. <laughs> I mean, it's all marketing and green screens and yep. like it's all like fake stuff. I mean, that's real estate for you, right? It's all marketing, it salesmanship. Is. It is. Um, it is. I mean, e most times like well, I'm kind of I'm always looking for certain things because I know the underwriting and there's something thing was I'm looking at the pitch deck that a lot of times it just isn't even in there. Right. Um, but I mean, I always just. 
I mean, this is where I've kind of built over time, like my network, right? It's like, right. who's this guy, right? Have you heard of this dude? Yeah. You know, oh yeah, you know, like X Y Z, right about him, right? That's what I go off of. But it took me a long time, and I've kind of stepped on some, you know, landmines here or there for sure. Of course. Um, but that's kind of what you use to build relationships with other peer pass investors to start to build your de- database. Jesus, Lane. I- I'm speechless. I, ladies and gentlemen, I've got, <laughs> I've got nothing. Yeah. I mean, you, you said you're nothing. investing in syndication. What is like the quality of your answers is in direct proportion to the quality of your questions. Like what's, what's something you've kind of wondered about as a passive doing investing in this type of stuff. I mean, cause a lot of times, like I see a lot of these like really bad forms. that are mm-hmm. just a bunch of like the blind leading the blind. Like there's 5% of the people that are talking <laughs> in there. And I like, I read this stuff cause I got like a fake login. Right. Like, what the heck is this guy talking about? He's <laughs> he's talking about like this cap rate thing, and it's like he's fumbling up the words. Like he right. doesn't. And then ninety five percent of people are like, "Oh yeah, John's really smart. He he knows his stuff." I'm like, dude, John doesn't know anything. He's just he's just trying to make himself sound cool. He don't know what he's talking about. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're you're actually speaking the absolute truth. A lot of the stuff that I've seen from the syndication side as a GP has been the spreadsheets and all that great stuff. But but the really gist of the matter is what's the mo- mo- amount of money coming back? What is the investor getting and how safe is the investor's money at the end of the day? Like, that's probably the biggest piece, because if you lose money for the investor, one, the investor is going to be annoyed, well, not just annoyed, probably pissed. And you're probably never going to see that investor again. Now that Yelp review drops down to half a star. And when they call the lanes and they call the these higher net worth or net value personnel, they're going to look at you like you're crazy because they already know your history, right? So, I, yeah. But the, the ugly truth of this thing is like, if somebody's really good at marketing, I mean, who cares? I mean, well, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say, but like <laughs> from their perspective, who cares if this guy gives you a one star review? Because there ain't no Yelp for this type of stuff. That's right? We're going to go complain to, right? I mean, if somebody makes a real stink about it, we're just going to do a cease and desist to the guy. I mean, I don't- stop. I don't know, Lane. I've I've seen a few people who have like, and granted, maybe take it with a grain of salt, I guess, right? Because, you know, I don't know everybody, don't know everything, but I've seen a few people who really, really destroyed their reputation. And granted, it is in circles. So, you know, on the East Coast, everybody may be talking to each other. That doesn't necessarily in the Midwest and the South, they're talking to each other or the West, right? Because, you know, get different groups of people. But a lot of them will say, hey, I talked to mike the other day and i'm not dealing with mike mike did this this and this to this this and this investor last time around and then it just happens over time of course they keep doing it like i think everybody's granted going to make a mistake at some point in time nobody's perfect by any means but when you keep doing the same thing over and over again and it's less a mistake more of you taking advantage of people or doing something that's against sec guidance or not above board then it starts to follow you around so maybe maybe it's kind of a little bit of both of those. Maybe it's kind of a little bit of both. At some point, you're yeah, gonna, yeah, you make the reputation bad for yourself. Yeah, I, I think there's if there's one little insight I can provide, it's like, well, not operators are are in the same field, right? right. You have in, big institutions, and some of my clients that are over four or five million dollars, I'll suggest they go operate. They, they will work with an institutional operator. Right. Institutional operator, you now they've been around for a long time. However, the downsides is you have lower investor splits, higher fees, mm-hmm. and in my opinion, just not good deals. I mean, right. they might be more reliable, right? Um, it's kind of like there's a lot of turnkey providers out there that everybody talks about, but they're, the prices of the properties are ten, twenty thousand dollars over market price. Wow, and you're kind of paying for the reliability, right? And then on the, on the other side, it's like, well, you have like a bunch of newbies who just did a boot camp the other day, or on their first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth deal. Um, but this is the hard part. It's like, well, how the heck do you determine the difference between an institutional operator that's been around for a long time and has a huge staff and somebody who's a brand newbie and who's in the middle that you kind of want to work with, a more boutique operator? Wow. I mean, it's, most in, passive investors don't really look at it from that perspective, right? right? But it's important to like, you know, kind of know what kind of level they're at and, you know, evaluate them accordingly. That's, that's, um, that's that's some serious insight, Lane. That's some serious insight. I I think I'm definitely gonna take that. And I've got that as a note as well. I'm gonna have to watch this again and listen to that over. Yeah. That's really good. Um, so I, I know we're getting tight for time, Lane. So 
at the end of the show, we always ask two questions. One is called Troop to Task. The other is a different question. We'll get to that shortly. But the Troop to Task lane is a military term. In the military, we tell people, hey, this is your Troop to Task. I'm going to give you one thing to do, and I want you to do this to get to whatever the destination is. In your case, being a passive investor, if you could give the listener and viewer a Troop to Task that can get one step that it can take to get closer to where you're at now in your level. Save up more money. I mean, at the end of the day, that's all what you're limited by. I mean, it shouldn't be time. You shouldn't be spending more than four hours a month on passive real estate investing. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you are, you're spending your time the wrong way. You should be on the phone, building relationships over the phone with 30 minute hour long conversations with real credit invested, passive investors. If you're not, you're just wasting your time. Spend your time on your highest, um, your, your highest output, which is likely at your day job, if that's the case. I like it. I like it. Matter of fact, with to quick follow up for that, how do you find those accredited investors, in your opinion? What's the best way to go about doing that? Ooh, I mean, you can come to the Simple Passive Cash Flow and pay us a boatload to join our mastermind. That's why we pay, <laughs> we charge people a boatload for it. But I, I mean, it. I don't know, man. I mean, that's why we charge a boatload for it because you can't find it anywhere else. Um, I love it. What I, the only advice I can provide is don't troll around like the free stuff, the free forms, the local RIA, because it's just usually just a bunch of lower net worth guys flipping houses, doing burrs, stuff like that. Because they hear real estate is a way to get rich quick. Right. right? If most most passive investors, especially for us, it's they make you know six figures, multiple six figures. They're busy people. They work 50, 60 hours a week, and then they also have kids and families. They're not going to go to some happy hour with a bunch of bros. 6 p.m., 5 p.m. after work. No, they're still they're still working, or they got to get their butt home and spend time with the family. Right. You know, and this is and a lot of past investors are not like, I have a million dollars. You know, they're that's they don't do that. So it's extremely hard to find these people. So the best place is don't go to a lot of those kind of the free stuff. I mean, if you can pay to get into something, that's that's the that's the best chance you're going to get. I would actually have to agree. Uh, you won't see a lot of the high net worth individuals hanging out at, you know, your local pub or your local bar. They're going to be in masterminds. They're going to be in groups like lanes. They're yeah. going to be out there on the street looking to find people on their level. And they know the same thing that we both that we're both saying is they're not at your local bar. They're not going to be hanging out watching the, the football game. They're going to be at home or they're going to be at a mastermind where specifically laid out to do just that. Or, you know, yeah. like, uh, like Lane said in his, at his site, go check it out. Um, so yeah. last question, Lane, and this one's a little bit tougher. What question do you wish you were asked more often? Hey man, if you were me, what would you do? Mm. So what's the answer to that question then? Well, based on your situation, right? That's where I start to dig and like, what's your net worth? What do you and your spouse make? How much time do you have? Because I'm trying to figure out what is your time, money, uh, resources here. You're a right. busy person. You got a lot of time. How much money are you able to save every year? You know, that's the question I always ask. I don't care what you make. All I care is what you save at the end of the year. I mean, I see a lot of people, especially in the Bay Area, that make three, four hundred thousand dollars, but are barely able to save twenty five grand. Wow. Which just befuddles me. Wow. Um, but you know, if you're able to save fifty, hundred grand, it's very different than somebody able to save thirty thousand dollars a year. That's true. That's very true. That's a that's a great that's a great way of laying that out. So, Lane, I know we got to go. We got to do the FAQ part of this thing. So, Lane, if you could please give the listener and the viewer your contact information, how to reach out to you, how to get a hold of you. I'm going to give you the floor right now. Um, yeah, if people are interested in investing in remote rentals, that's how I started. They can text the word remote to 314-665-1767. Um, they're interested in um, any of the stuff I talked about, check out my website, simplepassivecashflow.com, or start from the beginning and uh, check out the podcast, Simple Passive Cashflow, Passive Real Estate Investing. I love it. Lane, thank you again, man, so much for coming on. We might just have to get you back on and just to talk about the distance investing. That's something it seems to be a really hot topic. 
Um, but nonetheless, man, thank you again for coming on again. And I'm definitely looking forward to hearing your answers in the FAQ thing. That's going to be interesting because you've got a lot of great insight. So um, for those of you listening, thank you again for checking us out. Make sure you go and check out Lane's site. Check out the things Lane's doing. Lane is really making an impact in his area. And it's not just about high net worth individual. If you're looking to figure it out, he's a great person and great resource to start with. So ladies and gentlemen, remember, thank you for coming again. Like I said, remember, you're better than you were, but you're half as good as you're going to be. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.